So come on, let's stand to our feet. Let's get ready for the Word of God. Are you ready? And uh, this is going to be a, a very interesting sermon today. It's going to challenge us, help us recalibrate our thinking, help us to understand the importance of a topic like today. We're busy with a series called Growth Spurt. We started a month ago. We went through the book of Ephesians. This month, we're going to go through the book of James. James is the brother of Jesus, and it's going to challenge us. And I want to speak about trials, because trials equals growth. And how many of you want to grow and become a full, fully matured believer? All right? We want to grow. We want to mature. But trials is part of that. Tribulations, temptations. How many of you have never been tempted before? <laughs> no, no. We know that these things come at us, and, and they're part of uh, the challenges we face every day. So I want to help you today and help us through the Word of God to be inspired as we read the book of James, chapter 1 in a minute, to know that trials and tribulations and temptations actually can result in growth. So, Father, we stand to get today and we say, Lord, we are expecting the gain for your Word. Good soil, ready for your Word. Good soil, ready for instructions, ready for guidance, ready to have our lives, Lord, recalibrated, our thinking recalibrated, have our minds changed and transformed so that we align our thinking according to what you think and what you say and what you want. Because, Lord, we may have your thinking, we have your ways. So, Lord, lead us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Give somebody a high five next to you. Come on, say amen. James chapter 1 out of the TPT translation. James chapter 1. Oh, this is great. It says, greetings, my name is Jacob, another word for James, name for James. I'm a love slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm writing to all the 12 tribes of Israel who have been sown as seeds amongst the nations. And just for, for you a little bit of background, what had happened was that Israel and the, the tribes of Israel had been scattered all over the world. I mean, persecution was, was coming. Uh, it's probably written around about A.D. in the 60s, 65, 63, around there. We know that in A.D. 70, uh, Jerusalem got destroyed. Uh, and, you know, by then everybody had dispersed all over the world through persecution. So he's writing to all the 12 tribes of Israel who aren't all in Israel. They're all over the world uh, to be sown as seeds among the nations. My fellow believers, when it seems as though you are facing nothing but difficulties, see it as invaluable opportunity. And I'm like, hey. Invaluable, it means that there's no value. It's like so precious. See it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. I'm like stopping right there. Hold on, I'm just stopping right there. Trials, tribulation, persecution, suffering, and joy. How many of you know they don't, they don't seem to live in the same place? How is it possible to be joyous and, 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 and kind of appreciative and, and all those positive things that come with that? When you're going through difficulties, when you're going through tribulations, when you're going through struggle, pain, suffering. See it as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And then as your endurance grows even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. And if anyone, come on, somebody say anyone longs to be wise, ask God for wisdom and He'll give it to you. He won't see your lack of wisdom as an opportunity to smack you, to scold you over your failures, but He will overwhelm your failures with His generous grace. Just make sure you ask, empowered by confident faith. Somebody say confident faith. Without doubting that you will receive. For the ambivalent person, the double-minded person, the unstable thinker, Believes one minute and doubts the next. Being undecided makes you become like the rough seas driven and tossed by the wind. You're up one minute and tossed down the next. When you are half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the Lord when you're in that condition? Watch verse 12. Verse 12 then goes on to say, If your faith remains strong, everybody say strong faith. Even while surrounded by life's difficulties, you will continue to experience the untold blessings of God. True happiness comes as you pass the test with faith and receive the victorious, victorious crown of life promise to every lover of God. Don't you love the translation? So beautiful. But you see, the truth is the path of life is not an easy path to walk. Life is filled with all kinds of trials and temptations. 
You've probably heard the saying that when life gives you a lemon, make lemonade. I want to throw the lemons at people sometime. Anybody else? I'm like, don't give me that. You know, there's all these one-liners, these good one-liners, and some of you sitting here right now saying, I don't know if I even like what he's talking about today. So we're going to move you on to a place of joy in a minute, right? There's, right now, it just looks like lemons, but I'm sure that soon we're going to have some lemonade, right? But it's true that when life is throwing a lemon at you, maybe we, maybe we can experience that there's a possibility of some lemonade that can come out of this. Because throughout the Bible, there are people who have turned defeat into victory. I could spend a lot of time taking you through the Old Testament, the New Testament, looking at characters and circumstances and people, and, and, and to see how they are facing defeat in an incredible way, but how they turn it into victory. How they go through trials and how they turn it into triumph. How they, how they were possibly looking to, be, to become victims, but how they become victors. Because that's where God wants us. Because temptation on the outside, on the inside, you know, we have to learn how to become victors in that moment. And do you want to turn your trials into triumphs? Can somebody say amen if that's true? Well, if that's true, if you want to turn your trials into triumphs, if you want to turn a potential face of defeat into victory, well, there's four imperatives. There's four very important words that James brings to us in James chapter 1. The first one is the word count. And then he says when you need to count it, we'll see what it means in a minute, he talks about a joyful attitude in the counting. Then he uses the word you've got to also know, which talks about an understanding mind. He uses the word let. In other words, a surrendered will. Then he uses the word ask. And we're going to conclude with that this morning. It's a heart that wants to believe. Is there a heart that wants to believe you this morning? Is there, a heart, is there a heart that wants to believe on this side? I believe that is true. But let's look at the fact of trials for a minute. We will have many trials and temptations. The Bible tells us and God tells us to expect trials. And it's not if you fall into various trials. But when you fall, the scripture says, into various trials. Jesus, in fact, warned the disciples in John 16. He said, I've told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you'll have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Paul, told his, Paul the apostle told his converts that we must go through many tribulations. Peter the apostle says in 1 Peter 4 verse 12, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing will happen to you, is, is happening to you. Don't be surprised. Don't be caught of God. Or, you know, don't, don't think that you've lost the favor of God. Or you've, lost the, you know, you've lost the presence of God or God doesn't know or you, you're barren and isolated. You see, God allows temptations and trials for a purpose. And what He does in it and through it is to make us stronger, to make us more mature. You know, if you look at sandpaper, sandpaper is a, is, is a form of paper you use that's got rough edges, and it's meant to, you know, the wood is rough and they want to sh- kind of allow the, the wood to become more smoother so they can varnish it and, and the presentation can be, look better. So they take sandpaper and they rub it over. It's all about friction. More the friction, the, more the, res- the better the result is. What about an oyster? I was fascinated as you go and you look at pictures of how oysters are formed and, I mean, how pearls are formed. Because in, a, in an oyster, sometimes a grain of sand gets in there. And what happens is that sand becomes an irritant to the oyster. And so it irritates the oyster so much by being there that the oyster begins to engage it. It begins to try and cover it up. It, tries to try, it just kind of gets with that grain of sand to try and protect itself. But actually, through that irritation, that irritant context, it, uh, and that friction, it actually forms a beautiful pearl. And the oyster, in, I'm sure in its mind, it doesn't got a mind, but if the oyster really could think, it'd probably go like, I would never have thought something beautiful would come out of my life from a grain of sand. It's the same thing with the melting of metals. You know, gold, gold is purified in the heat. Gold is purified in the fire. And who would have ever thought that something so beautiful as gold could come out of something so violent as a fire, as a fiery furnace? But by conquering then, the Bible clearly says that we can become more like Christ. And, and 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a, in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, are being changed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So watch this carefully. God wants us to be transformed. God is transforming us. How is He changing us and transforming us? What's the purpose? What's the end goal? Is to go from glory to glory. To glory. In other words, a better Christ life, a more improved Christ life, a more empowered Christ life. You know, it's more and more just like Christ. Hi, by His Spirit. 
Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, But our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us. You would, you, some of you sitting here maybe for the first time here, you go like, I would never have thought that my negative, bad, horrible circumstances can work something good for me. The Bible says that God will work all things for good. How do you think that happens? But this light affliction, he goes like, it's just a light affliction. It's but for a moment. Many of us think that everything is, is forever. Many of us think that our circumstances are going to last forever. It's just a season. It's just a season. And sometimes in, in that light affliction, we abandon ourselves completely, like the disciples in the boat with Jesus. Jesus says, let's go. just before that, they had all these miracles. Then they were in the boat, and Jesus said, let's go to the other side, a promise of the future, a promise of fulfillment. And they were in the boat, the storm comes up. What do they do in that light afflicted moment, in that light moment, although it seemed like, but in their minds, their perspective was that it's all over. We're all going to die. Nothing good can come out of this. And they even get up and they wake Jesus up and they turn on Jesus. And they're like, Jesus, you don't even care. You're not in control. And they, they lose complete perspective of what actually is going on. Never mind the fact that he's there. Never mind the fact that he's made the promise. Never mind the fact that he's already proved himself in the past. That if he's done it in the, in the past, he can do it in my, in my present. Never mind the fact that he'll do it in the future. He says, it is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You see, ultimately, God wants to get something better out of our lives than what we've had in the past. Your greatest growth spurt moments are often as a result of trials and difficulties. I can truly say that I've, I've come to Christ since 1983. I've been saved since 1983. And I can tell you now, through the trials and difficulties I've been through, my greatest growth moments have been through those moments. That's when I've really seen the greatness of God. That's when I've really seen the badness of myself. The weakness of my life. We have actually really just turned to God and said, God, unless you are with me, unless you are lead me, leading me, unless you are building my life, unless, God, I cannot do it without you. Then I've truly understood what it means to abandon myself into his hands and to his arms. So let's look at those four key words quickly in James chapter 1. God tells us to count with a joyful attitude. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The word count means to evaluate. When we become Christians, we must evaluate our lives and we need to set new goals. We need, we need to allow God to lead us into the newness of our lives. The Bible says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. For the new to come in the, what it should be and, how it sh and, and what should be engaged in our lives and what should be leading us in our lives, we need to get renewed thinking. We need to allow his word to, in our lives. We need to allow his direction. We need to allow him to recalibrate everything in our lives. And so we need to evaluate our lives. And allow Him to take us to where He wants us to go. So we've got to evaluate the trials of life in the light of what God is doing for us and live for the things that matter the most. What matters the most to you. Because the truth is our values determine our evaluations. A lot of people evaluate wrong and incorrectly what they're going through. Like the disciples in the boat, they evaluated them and they made a conclusion out of that and it was a, it was a wrong conclusion. And their evaluation led to their actions. If we value comfort more than character, then trials will upset us. If we value the material more than the spiritual, then we will not be able to count it all joy. If we live only for the present and forget the future, then trials will make us better, not better. You see, Job had the right attitude and the right outlook. He said this in Job 23. He said, but he knows the way I take. When he has tested me, not if, but when, I shall come forth as gold. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want what Job went through. I'm not claiming Job's experience as mine. I don't want that experience. Anybody there with me today? But Job had a very healthy perspective. Even his own wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? Nice wife. His own friends abandoned him. But Job had a very powerful and a correct perspective of God. He knew that God ultimately was, so that God ultimately was sovereign. You see, the source of endurance is going to come through testing trials and temptations. Now, secondly, not only must we count it, measure it right, but he said we've got to know some things. He says we've got to know something, an understanding mind. You've got to have an understanding mind. It says in James 1 verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. When you know that what you're going through, what you're in, what's coming against you, if you will face it correctly, if you'll stand up correctly, if you'll understand it correctly and, and, res and, and, and respond appropriately, it will produce something better in your life. Because faith is always going to be tested. The testing of your faith produces patience. The Bible calls it endurance. 
Patience means to be steadfast, more persevering, more enduring. God tested Abraham in order to increase his faith. By faith, Abraham. By faith. Go read Hebrews chapter 11. The men and women of faith. By faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it talks about that testing works for us, not against us. Because Satan tempts us to bring out the worst. Isn't that true? He roams around, the Bible says, seeking who he may devour. He's like a roaring lion. But Jesus tests us to bring out the best. Wonderful scriptures in Romans 8 and 1 Peter chapter 1. It is our choice in which way we respond. Most of us will ask the Lord to, the Lord to say, God, won't you change our circumstances? But God's primary purpose is not to change your circumstances. He wants to change you. His main goal and purpose is to, is to change you. Number three, not only must we have an understanding, and we need to know, not only must we evaluate and count things, but number three, we need to let trials do their work. But let patience, James 1 verse 4 says, have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's quite a challenge. It's very quiet in here today. But how many of you know this is so true? You gotta listen, let, some things you've got to just face up to and deal with in a way that God helps you to do so that he can produce what he wants to produce in your life. God tells us to let something happen, a surrendered will. What God, what, and what does God want to produce in our lives? Patience. That's something that I really, I don't want to say I'm struggling with because that means God's going to give me more opportunity to practice patience. <laughs> Somebody said, God, give me patience. And God says, sure, I'm going to give you opportunity to practice patience. Patience is not a spiritual gift. How many of you wish it was? Spiritual gift is not something you earned or deserved. It's just the grace and the mercy of God. But what God tends to do, the fruit of the Spirit, is to give you an opportunity to work that out in your life. And often, patience can only come as a result of friction, irritation. You know, have you heard of grace growers? Some people at your workplace, they're, like, they're growing the grace of God in your life. They grow, they, they're irritants. Maybe you are the irritant. But you know what? If you can just allow God, there's going to be a pearl that's going to come out of that. If it's so fiery, this tribulation, the difficulty, this trials, this temptation, it's so hard. Well, you know what? God can bring gold out of this. And if maybe somebody just rubbing up the wrong way, well, maybe they're just smoothing out the, ed the edges of your life. Patience means to persevere and keep on persevering, never giving in. To take the initiative and to exert the energy and the effort to conquer, to gain the victory and to triumph over the trial and temptation. God wants us to grow up. Everybody say grow up. In other words, He wants us to mature. God wants our cooperation. Ephesians 2 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's a gift from God. Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handy work. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians 2 verse 8 talks about God's work for us, which is salvation by grace. We don't earn it. It's a gift from heaven. Then it talks about God's work in us, which is the sanctification part. We are His workmanship. He's working out something in our, in our lives with us, not apart from us. But then it also talks about God's work through us, which is the service, which is created in Christ Jesus for works. And so, so God has to save us, but then He sanctifies us by working with us and through us for services that He's prepared for us to do. So He wants us to grow up so that we can accomplish all that He has for us. So when we look at trials and temptations as opportunities, then only then we'll begin to face them with joy, the joy of the Lord. You're only, when you see it as an opportunity, truly as an opportunity, then you'll go like, the joy of the Lord is my strength. But have you ever felt like you're the only one who's ever gone through something? <laughs> have you ever felt like there's no escape from you, for you? You feel so trapped. And you think, am I ever going to get through this? Have you felt like that? Am I ever going to get through this? Am I ever going to get over this? Am I ever going to get out of this? And you feel so trapped by what's happening in and around you. Well, I want to encourage you today. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape. That you may be able to endure it. You see, when a person stands against trial and temptations and conquers them, he perfects the purpose of God, that is to become more like Jesus. He perfects his task and purpose for being on earth a little bit more. 
Perfect means perfection of purpose. An end, an aim, a goal, it's a purpose. So it's not just about perfection, so now that's it. It's about so that your life can have more meaning and more significance. That we grow in the grace of God. We grow in all, all that he has for His goal is to change you. Because if he can change you, he can use you to be an agent of change in the world around you. It makes one complete. A person becomes more and more complete in all parts. Day by day, trial by trial, temptation by temptation. When we persevere under the circumstances, we become more like Jesus Christ. What is the end result? Lacking nothing. The person who lacks nothing, wants nothing. You will have all the abundance and the fullness of life. Verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, because this is the way to India. If anyone lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. Worship team, come up, and it will be given to you. So lastly, number four, what do we do? We ask. We've got to learn how to ask. We've got to learn how to go to God, speak to God. Ask in faith. The Bible says unwaveringly. Some people ask, but they're not so sure. Some people ask, but they do it because they know they've got to do it. But we've got to ask in faith to believe that, that He's a reward of them that diligently seek Him. That we can come to Him as His children, not because He wants to judge us or condemn us or drive us down or drive us away or, or rebuke us, or, but actually that because He's waiting for you to talk to Him. He's waiting for you to come to Him. To believe that he's a reward of them that's, that diligently seek him. But when we ask, it says in verse 6, we must believe and not doubt. It's a choice. I either doubt or I believe. There is no middle ground. You're either a doubter or you're either a believer. Do you know what they, how they described the early church? They were fully devoted followers of Christ. They, talk, they spoke about the early church as believers. The word Christian only came later. The believers were together in one room. The believers had everything in common. The believers, not the doubters. The doubters gathered together every Sunday at Life Church in Cape Town. The doubters came to the Lord and said, Lord, maybe. Lord, are you sure? Lord, I'm not so sure. Lord, let's see what happens now. The believers. People of faith, unwavering faith. They know doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. You see, wavering receives nothing. Wavering shows instability, verse 7 and verse 8. What we need to do is ask for His divine ability. We need to ask Him for the Holy Spirit. We need to ask through the Holy Spirit. In fact, last Sunday, as I close with this, is this helping anybody? Last Sunday, last Sunday, listen carefully. In Acts chapter 2, this is Pentecost Sunday. In Acts chapter 2, Jesus had already told them, as we know in Acts chapter 1, go wait in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 2, they're waiting in the upper room and they receive the power of the Holy Spirit. They receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Power to be my witnesses. Power to live this life. Power for everything that I've called you to do. The Bible says that Jesus moved in the power of the Spirit. Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. He needed the power of the Spirit Himself. Acts chapter 2, they receive the power. Remember I said this last week? Acts chapter 3, the very next chapter, they encounter tribulation. They encounter persecution. They encounter horrible, horrible opposition. Horrible. Acts chapter 4, what do they do? They don't waver. They don't stumble back. They don't reduce God into their own image, into their own understanding. No, no, they get up before God. And they get up back in that upper room and they say, God, God, you see what these people are doing. You see what is happening around you. You see the opposition. You see the accusations. You see the difficulties. God, you see that. So God, God, no, 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 God, you sort them out. No, no, they say, God, give us, give us confidence, boldness, so that we can address it. We can speak out in your name. We can step out into the situation. We don't shrink back. We don't move back. We step out with faith. We step out, step out with confidence. And the Bible says, as you know, they got before the Lord and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Filled. The Bible says the place where they were meeting was shaken by the power of God. And then it says, they spoke the word of God with boldness. You know why they got boldness? Why did they get boldness? Because they asked. They knew what was limiting them, what was lacking was confidence, faith, 
And they said, we, gotta, we, gotta, we need boldness. Because in Acts 2, they were bold. And they, did step, they stepped out and they believed and they were unwavering in the, way, in the way they spoke and the way they did things. And, and the devil tried to rob them of that. Came with accusations, came with opposition, came with difficulty and tempted them away from it and, and, and just tried to corrupt their thinking and, and reduce their faith to just nothing. And they said, God, we can't let this happen. And they asked, what are you asking God for today? What's the very thing that you need today to get you to the next place? From glory to glory to glory. Everyone is at a different place. Would you just close your eyes and bow your head right now?